Hello, I'm Tony Abramson, and today I'll be presenting another talk in Matt Hill's Virtual Festival of Coins, entitled The Lure of Skeets. When considering skeets, it's appropriate to recall E.F. Schumacher's dictum that small is beautiful. I'm enthralled by these enigmatic and luring fragments of history, which open a portal to the economic vibrancy, religious beliefs, mythology, art, and technical competence of what many still mistakenly call the Dark Ages. First of all, let's get some terminology in place to avoid confusion. The Anglo-Saxon term for the tremesis is thrimza, better called a gold chilling. The skeet or shatter is now usually referred to as an early penny or early silver penny. The Dark Age is better termed the conversion period consequent upon Augustine's mission of 597 to the Kentish court of King Ethelbert. And Merovingian refers to the ruling dynasty in Francia during the period under discussion. The origins of early pennies can be found in the late Roman coinage, specifically the tremesis, one third of a solidus. The tremesis shown here is referred to as the victory type due to the reverse motif. Tribes migrating to Western Europe were in fact far from barbarous and quickly assimilated Roman customs and practices. Emulating Roman coin types, specifically the victory tremesis, gave their currency authority and authenticity. Many so-called pseudo-imperial victory tremesis have been found in England evincing the extent of early commerce between England and the continental Gothic tribes. In Francia, the victory type was eventually superseded by another long-lived coinage, referred to as the National Series, naming the Mint and Mania. The existence of 800 minting places and 1,600 manias shows the sophistication and volume of Merovingian coinage. Again, many have been found in England as a result of commerce. There have been very few hoards of this material found in England. The first hoard found at Sutton Hoo Ship Burial, Mound 1, contained 37 different continental gold tremesies. This princely burial is thought to be that of King Radwald of East Anglia, who died around 624. In recent years, a substantial hoard of continental origin has been discovered at Fincham, West Norfolk, despite initial attempts to evade disclosure. Conventionally, the Crondall Hoard was held to be the earliest indication of English minting. Designs emulated Roman prototypes, here highlighted in blue, invoking Romanitas, the spirit of Rome, or were Merovingian tremesies, as shown here highlighted in green. However, the majority, 69 of the 101 pieces in the hoard, were gold shillings in crude native styles, highlighted here in red. Included among the Crondall hoard were two shillings eventually attributed to the Adbald of Kent. Given the poor literacy of early inscriptions, the reverse legend of this type has defied full interpretation. Some of the specimens now known seem to read London, whereas others can be transliterated to give a blundered rendering thus. It's not a huge leap to read this as Melitus. Melitus was one of several papal emissaries sent in 601 to support Augustine's mission. The York coins are not represented in the Crondall Hoard, possibly as York is so remote from Crondall. I've recently interpreted that this type, this York type, shown here as reading Paulinus, another of the Roman emissaries sent with Melitus. Paulinus became Bishop of York around 627 when Edwin was King of Northumbria. Melitus and Paulinus would have been steeped in both the economic and symbolic functions of coinage. It is quite conceivable that they influenced respectively the Adbald of Kent and his brother-in-law Edwin of York to act in concert. 
According to Bede, speaking of the Adbal, after his conversion and in the monastery of the most blessed Prince of the Apostles, that is St. Peter's Canterbury, he built a church of the Holy Mother of God, which was consecrated by Archbishop Mellitus. This must place it between 619 and 624. Then Bede speaks of Edwin, soon after his baptism, which was Easter at St. Peter's York, at Paulinus's suggestion, he gave orders to build a larger and more noble basilica of stone. This must be in the period 627 to 633. I would suggest that they both issued gold coins with a common purpose to commemorate the erection of a church. Returning to the Merovingian coinage found in England, over the 90 year duration of the Frankish National Series, the gold content fell, as can be seen here from this pale gold specimen. Similarly, Anglo-Saxon gold shillings lost purity as volume increased, and more transactions were brought into the economic net. Pada, shown here, was the more prolific of the two issuers of pale gold shillings during this transitional phase. A second, if less prolific mania, of the transition period was Varnimundus, possibly a Munia from the Metz region of Francia. Recent archaeological evidence on grave goods and ice core analysis has advanced the transition from gold to silver by as much as two decades to the 660s. At a stretch, this may resurrect the formally discredited association of the Parda coinage with Parda of Mercia. The transition to a new denomination is complete with the disappearance of any gold content from what is now the silver early penny coinage. Again, only one denomination circulated, there was no small change. Given the tiny module, about 11 millimetres, better specimens may be regarded as among the best of early Anglo-Saxon art. Skeets in collectible condition remain difficult to obtain. Rare varieties, those in outstanding condition, those with provenance, and especially those with pedigree, attract the premium. The phases of the early Anglo-Saxon penny vary between the north and south of England. The primary phase is earlier and longer in the south. The secondary phase is later and longer in the north. Skeets, skeets of similar module, weight and alloy were issued in the regions bordering the North Sea, England, Netherlands, France and Denmark, certainly by kings and bishops, but probably also by merchants, although that's difficult to prove. The coins are interchangeable despite the huge variation in design. The mix found in trading locations may indicate the range of commercial relations. The emporia or wicks bordering the North Sea are the mint places, although some peripatetic striking is likely. Although this map is well out of date, the wide dispersal of the coinage is clear. Fundamentally, the coinage is a medium of exchange, although the denomination, worth, I would suggest, perhaps a day's pay, remained too high to capture many regular transactions. Monetization is inhibited by the absence of small change. Metcalf estimated that the output of the Low Countries was prodigious, perhaps 27 million for Series D and twice that for Series E even if this is based on double the actual die longevity. So half this volume, say 40 million coins, is massive and not matched for several centuries subsequently. Nevertheless, partly due to the minute module, the survival rate is low. Much was for trade with England, demonstrating the vibrancy of economic activity around the North Sea. English law was codified from the start of the 7th century, but based largely on cases brought before the judiciary. Many penalties were financial compensation for harm done with settlement enumerated in coin. 
the widespread reintroduction of coinage also facilitated payment of church dues. Even though only the northern coins were literate, identifying each historically documented issuer clearly, as ringed here in blue, the southern English skeets were largely uninscribed, but for a few notable exceptions. Despite this, the Christianizing imagery is potent and often expressed metaphorically. The medium is the message for this conversion period coinage. However, there are examples of ambiguity, often due to the issuers wanting to appeal to a spectrum of differing traditions. The coins, coinage draws inspiration from these diverse traditions. Influences include Roman, Byzantine, Germanic, Anglo-Saxon, Christian, and Pagan. The coinage is divided by the uh, Aston Rowan Hoard, conventionally dated to around 710. The hoard consists of primary phase coins of conservative style. Classical coinage remains a major influence. However, this is the subsequent coinage of the secondary phase displays an explosion of creativity with innovative designs, though often the meaning remains tantalizing beyond reach. There is only slight evolution of style during the primary phase. The radiate bust of Kentish series A with its votive standard rebirth is continued in series C with an expansion into the Thames area and abroad in series D. It continues to the end of the secondary phase as East Anglian series R. C, D and R replace the lettering of series A with runes, possibly an amuletic association with Bishop Epper, who saved his abbey Celsi from plague. The other main component of the primary phase is series B, again displaying conservative styles with a bird on cross reverse in a serpent circle. This is continued stylistically into the second phase as series J. Stuart Rigold mapped out the primary series in 1960, then in 1977, encapsulated the entire early penny classification in the mere 11 pages in the British Numismatic Journal, a paradigm of brevity. A more comprehensive study is Michael Metcalfe's magnum opus, extending to nearly 700 pages plus lavish plates. However, his three weighty tomes were of academic gravity. Anna Gannon made a groundbreaking contribution to the field with her study of iconography, giving a scholarly tour of art historical forms from which the engravers of Skeets drew their inspiration. My aim in cre creating a shatter list was to improve access to this complex and neglected coinage, to simplify identification and give an indication of scarcity and value for the collector. Occasionally, the Southern English skeets are graced by inscriptions, although a lack of historical documentation prevents identification of the issuers or moneyers named. Here we see a scarce Saro Aldo, an extremely rare Valdobertus, and an iconic Athilirev. As already mentioned, also belonging to the primary phase is Series D from the Low Countries. Generally, the portrait is right facing. Metcalf held that what he called lateral reversal implied imitative or unofficial design. However, this superb specimen demonstrates, as Rigold, uh, Rigold stated, that the lines between official and derivative are blurred. The dominant Series E skis from the Netherlands are presented are present in England in substantial numbers, evincing the depth of trade. Metcalf noted the prevalence of porcupine skeets in sheep rearing chalk uplands. The evident numismatist Humphrey Sutherland proposed the description porcupine for want of a better description. It is actually a degenerate bust and only becomes dominant in the secondary phase. The origins of the reverse votive standard can be seen in this Roman type, 
where the standard proclaims that the emperor has served 20 years, may he fulfill his vows for another 20. From the despairing and perplexed looks on the faces of the captives, let's just take a close up of that. This was not a universal, uh, universally popular plea. Production of low country skeets was prodigious. Volumes have not subsequently exceeded for centuries. For an in-depth study of and comprehensive identifica identification guide to series D and the incredibly complex series E, I strongly recommend the Yarbock volumes by Obdenvelder and Metcalf. The first volume covers series D, uh, that's 2003, and two volumes published in 2009 to 10 cover series E. English trading currencies in the secondary phase, notably series R, were made in lower but still significant volumes. Note the longevity of the runes reading EPA and the continued use of a votive standard reverse. The immobile design is intended to convey stability and inspire confidence. I would now like to take a closer look at some of the outstanding art in the Southern Secondary Phase, although I claim no expertise in art history. While the artistry has lost the engraver's skill of classical times, these modern portraits are not to be dismissed as crude. They contrast starkly with the disintegrated runic busts of the mass-produced series C, D and R. Regarding this last coin, forward-facing portraits recall Byzantine images. As Rory Naismith has written, they are perceived as carrying an air of serene disconnection that was thought especially proper for Christ and the saints. Forward-facing portraits were already present in the primary phase, as shown by series Z, which evolves through several stages. Here we have a portrait of a distinctly haunted appearance. The last one, a unique specimen, is particularly charismatic, perhaps portraying a death mask. The reverse displays a creature conventionally described as a hound, but appears to me much more like a wild boar, a venerated symbol from the classical world and Northern European mythology. On the Bentig Range helmet, the pagan boar, associated with protection, faces towards a cross on the nasal in a display of syncretism, the fusion of ideologies. This carved side panel of St Cuthbert's coffin shows a similar figure with forked beard and halo, though the almond shaped eyes appear to be open. The coinage shows many twin standard bearers. This series N specimen unusually shows them facing over a long cross pomay. Note the stark contrast between the overt militarism of Roman prototypes and the humility of the early pennies. Perhaps the observer was prompted to recall the biblical phrase, they shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. The allusions are to biblical precepts rather than military conquest. Whilst the first shown here is a fairly typical example of the standard bearer design with cross and bird of prey, the second is extremely rare and more complex. Note particularly the tiny creatures either side of the almost featureless head. Often one or both long crosses are replaced by foliage. This fifth unique image is remarkable in the number of crosses incorporated. Two, two triquetras as headdresses, a long cross pomme either side, a pectoral cross on the chest, and two more inverted at the hem, seven in all. Perhaps the final rather curious image recalls the biblical phrase, go naked. The Roman origins of this obverse are self-evident. The motif is also familiar from contemporary artefacts, such as the stunning 
early 8th century Franks or Ozern whale's bone casket. On the left panel, the she-wolf lies on its back with the twins above, back to back, as shown in the detail here. In the first coin, the twins are nourished by drops of milk. In the lower obverse, they hold a cross pomade between them. However, the reverse is even more enchanting. A songbird is poised in long stalks of foliage, which bend to bear its weight. The imagery is rich in metaphor. Returning to continental skeets, in the secondary phase, the porcupine is full blown and the reverse standard evolves into more complex forms. This mass produced coinage of the Low Countries issued during the tenure of the powerful King Radbod favours anonymity, possibly to enhance its currency. Rarely do we see portrayal. However, in the margin of this specimen is a tiny, beautifully crafted bird. There are many iconic designs in this coinage. Here we see a lion with a curling tongue and a cross above. The animal mask type is a highly desirable rarity, whereas Series H with its reverse peacock was made in substantial numbers in the Hampshire Emporium of Hamwick. The peacock was a symbol of immortality to, due to the reputed incorruptibility of its flesh. Incoming skeets to Hamwick were recycled into this local design. Dyes are differentiated and enumerated by a wide variety of mint marks on both obverse and reverse. The final image on this slide, the swan, was illustrated in Withian Ryle as early as 1756 and then disappeared from view for 240 years. Although the plate in Withian Ryle is drawn by the notorious John White, the skeets are faithfully portrayed. The swan reverse is highlighted here. Let me just expand that. Shown below is an example of series M. Here. Series M has a sinuous animal obverse with a vine scroll reverse. The rare variety has what Anna Gannon has described as a paschal lamb. The reverse is familiar from many contemporary sculptings of inhabited vine scrolls. The mythological centaur has been reinterpreted in Series S from barbarity into a caring and nurturing Christian context perhaps intended to reflect the spiritual journey of the Anglo-Saxons. The reverse displays a beaded spiral cross consisting of the tongues of four rotating serpents, serpents used ambiguously to convey protection in the Germanic tradition or a mortal threat in the Christian repertoire. So possibly both sides project the same theme, an evolution from barbarity to morality. A similar reverse has just three serpents, the Triskelis, which is familiar from contemporary artifacts, including the hanging bell from Sutton Hill and this beautiful pendant from Kent, whose design spirals outwards. The spiral of two creatures, probably birds rather than serpents, evokes the interlace pattern prevalent on illuminated manuscripts and early Anglo-Saxon artifacts, such as this elaborate buckle from Sutton Hoo. This tiny curled serpent looks ferocious with its barbed tongue. However, this more complex construct envelops the cross protectively. Again, we are presented with a fierce serpent with a vicious forked tongue. However, the creature is surrounded by a second serpent. We can see its head above the eye of the, first of the inner serpent. If this is to protect the observer from the evil eye, then the engraver is thinking on a higher plane. In the second specimen, the protective enveloping serpent is more clearly executed with its head directly above that of the inner serpent. 
The geometric designs in the Shatter series tease the eye, such as this beautiful expanding Celtic cross with rosettes filling the quarters. The extremely rare cross encre also hides a pellet cross in the void. This annular cross variety is set against the starry background. Not a scrap of space is left unfilled. This horror of vacant space is a feature of the dense carpet pages of illuminated manuscripts. Perhaps an evil spirit will infiltrate the slightest void. These geometric designs resonate with the wonderful garnet encrusted cruciform inlaid jewellery of the period. Here we see an abundance of intricate cross on craze. And here we see stepped elements in blue crystal. And here again in garnet. Plausibly, some skeets with geometric designs are attempting to emulate jewellery. The reverse of this geometric design is a backward looking biped with a leg raised behind its head. We see a beast in a similar posture on contemporary sculpture. The creature could be a custodian of treasure in the Ger Germanic tradition, although it appears to be in terror-stricken flight here. The coinage is not only rich in metaphor, albeit obscure, but it is intentionally ambiguous. Is the snake here emanating from the lion's mouth hostile or protective? It could be both. Might it convey different meanings to diverse groups of observers, depending on their origins and beliefs? There is much that lies tantalising beyond our comprehension. The Germanic tradition recalls Tolkien's smout protecting the pile of gold. Uniquely among ancient coins, Pairing some skeets tells a story. Here we have a wading bird with a serpent rising to attack from below. On the second specimen, we have the foreground bird challenged by a pincer jawed fiend. In the third example, we have a confrontation between the backward looking bird on the right and the open jawed serpent left. They all allude to the eternal conflict between good and evil. How will this be resolved? In the first case, the bird tramples its attacker underfoot and now looks to the cross. In the second, the serpent is replaced by the cross. And finally, we have a more complex scene. The bird turns its back on the serpent and again looks to the cross. Remarkably, the serpent looks crestfallen. The observer is reminded of the biblical phrase, get thee behind me, Satan. Of course, in the world of 2020, I may have got these pairings in the wrong order. Historians, medievalists and archaeologists have catalogued every comparable contemporary artefact, stone, stone sculpture, illuminated manuscripts, paintings and icons, carvings, jewellery and ornaments. Coinage remains the most fertile and yet most neglected source. Now turning to Northumbria, which occupied a substantial area between the Humber and the Firth of Forth. It was divided into two feuding kingdoms. To the north, Venetia occupied a geographically larger area ruled in the Iron Age by the Brigantes. To the south, the area was the rival dynastic house occupying a smaller area, including the land of the Iron Age parasite to the east. Occupancy of the throne swung like a pendulum between these fierce dynastic rivals. In the 7th century, nearly all Northumbrian monarchs died in the quest to conquer territory. In the 8th, nearly all died in the internecine conflict. In 685, against the counsel of his advisors, including Cuthbert, the ambitious king Egfrith fought the Picts at Dunnefte. In the subsequent annihilation, he lost much northern territory, his army, reputation and life. His austere half-brother, Aldfrith, succeeded to the throne. Bede referred to this monarch as a man most, ably, uh, a man most learned who ably restored the shattered fortunes of the kingdom. Sir Frank Stenton considered him equivalent to Alfred the Great in learning and strategy. 
Ulfric was the first king identifiably named on the English coinage. His only failing was the inadequacy of his succession. As a result, the kingdom was run by incompetence for a third of a century after his death. No recognisably Northumbrian skeets were minted in the third of a century after Ulfrith, but the deficiency was made good by use of southern skeets, predominantly of series J and G. Whether some elements of J are indeed northern emissions is disputed. A Frankish denier of Reims was an earth near Bridlington, possibly a prototype. Perhaps the design implies collaboration of church and state rather than confrontation. The Mirdheads recall a stata of the Iceni in its iconography. I will briefly speculate on a couple of other skeets with possible Northumbrian associations. This is primary series E variety G from the Low Countries. I have added an extremely rare variety with a reverse that departs from the normal beaded standard. The margin contains a legend starting VV, that's W, I, L, L. More clearly seen in this specimen. Within the compartment is a Y-shaped symbol, an crozier. It was suggested to me by Professor DeWitt that this may have been issued by Willie Broad, a Northumbrian emissary who became Bishop of Utrecht for 44 years. This long tenure mirrors the duration of Series E. What may clinch the argument is that Willie Broad's attribute was a crozier, as shown centrally on the coin. The second type for which I have postulated Northern associations, partly due to the Northern fine spots, is what I have dubbed the fledgling variety. It's more likely an osprey. The one that Bede re features in his biographical Life of Cuthbert. On close inspection, our bird clearly has a fish in its mouth with which it intends to give Cuthbert and his assistants sustenance on their sojourn. Eventually, Northumbrian coinage was restored with the literate and wonderfully handsome fantastic beast issue of the advert a significant improvement stylistically on Altrith's efforts. The beast could be a fusion of biblical lion and Celtic stag, recalling a popular pagan deity of the north. Here we see a rock carving from Whithorn in Dumfries and Galloway. There is also an obvious affinity of design between East Anglia and Northumbria. The reverse of this East Anglian skeet is the exceptionally rare stag variety of series Q. The occupant of the East Anglian Sutton Who Man burial edged his bets between paganism and Christianity. And here we see a scepter mounted above by the antlered stag. I'll digress from Northumbrian coins for a moment. The Gundestrup cauldron features an antlered deity grasping a powerful snake. The stag represented a potent beast, and the antlers exemplified the annual cycle of renewal and rejuvenation. This cycle is recalled, for example, in the serpent border of series B, where the universal self-sustaining Ouroboros bites its own tail. Another representation of the cycle of renewal and revival is the triple tail on many of the beasts shown on skeets. It is thought to represent the tree of life and its associated mythology. Returning to Northumbria, the fantastic beast type continued for half a century after its revival by Beadbert, being issued by a succession of monarchs. However, Bede's death in 735 denies us his perceptive judgment and historical perspective on their performance in office. The only exceptions to the fantastic beast type for occasional joint issues, such as the two exceptionally rare types of the patrician king, Ethelwald Moll, one with Moll's son, Ethelred, even though his succession to the throne was interrupted by rival dynasts. The other joint issue 
as with Archbishop Edgbert. It speaks volumes for Edgbert's diplomacy that he was able to issue jointly with a succession of rival dynasts after the retirement of his brother, the Advert, as king. In acknowledgement of iconoclasm under Elfwald I, there was a transition away from pagan or indeed any imagery in Northumbria. The reverse now named the Mania, as shown here. This had the benefit of transferring responsibility for the integrity of the coinage to a named official, in this case, Cuthart, who was sufficiently resilient to serve a succession of rival monarchs. Here we see Cuthart again, together with his fellow moneyers at Ethelred's Mint, all clearly engraved by the same hand. There is a su suggestion in Stuart Lyon's Silly that the last of these, Guthgills, was active after the devastating Viking assault on Lindisfarne Farm in 793. The Cuthgill skeet is a poor fabric and the workmanship has deteriorated, which is only to be expected under the relative austerity after the attack on Lindisfarne. Farm. But the symbolism of the shrine could be a reference to the destruction of 793. Unsurprisingly, the raid had great economic significance. The confidence underlying North Sea trade collapsed, along with the coinage. Ethelred died in a revenge attack at Eardwulf's behest in 796. And we know of a mere handful of skeets of the mighty Eardwulf. 796 also saw the deaths of Offa of Mercia and his successor, his son. The Northumbria scholar, Northumbrian scholar Alcuin refers to it as the Black Year. Given the exogenous shock of Lindisfarne, the North was in no position to migrate to the broad penny introduced by Offa and his contemporaries following Frankish precedent. The only known money for Yardwolf was the enduring Cuthart. This is possibly the choicest survivor. Yardwolf was one of the two patrons of Bruden on the Hill. This imposing church is replete with sculpting of a period, much of it comparable with motives from the coinage. Eventually, Yardwolf's son, Ianred, resurrected the skeet, but the silver content was much reduced. This issue probably predates Northumbria's submission to Wessex at Dor in 829. Could this possibly be the same Cuthherd? Conventionally, these coins are regarded as stikers, but it is better to reserve that name for the truly base subsequent coinage issued until the Viking conquest of York in 867. The unprepossessing and mass-produced Stiker was wrongfully denigrated by most numismatists until this century. However, it represents a step change in monetization, as the intrinsic value is, for the first time, commensurate with daily needs and provides the populace with a coin sufficient to surrender to the church for the salvation of souls without it being too great a financial imposition. The church's stake, take is evidenced by a substantial hoard of these base coins in the absence of higher denominations. I've only touched the tip of the Shatter Iceberg. There's still so much we don't know and we shouldn't confuse belief with knowledge. Remember, what isn't surmise is conjecture.